Dr. Stephen Nix is an assistant professor, neuropathologist, and director of ophthalmic pathology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He earned his Doctor of Medicine degree at UAMS, participated in the Medical Research Scholars Program at the National Institutes of Health, and completed an anatomic pathology and a neuropathology residency with a special focus on head and neck pathology at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In addition to clinical research, Dr. Nix is committed to medical student and resident pathology education, including serving as the director of the Senior Medical Student Anatomic Pathology Elective Rotation, and he recently received an Outstanding Anatomic Pathology Education Award as chosen by UAMS senior residents. Dr. Nix is also interested in the health humanities and has published multiple creative writing pieces, as well as re received an award for short fiction. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Oviedo. And, uh, you know, I've been, um, you know, going to the AANP since I was a medical student. So it's a, it's a great honor to be uh, speaking uh, today for teaching rounds. All right. Oh, so can everyone see my slides before I get going? Yes. Yeah. All right. So we can see so today we're going to be talking about the skull base and you know the the emphasis of this talk is going to be things that are going to be relevant to neuropathology practice. Just a couple of weeks ago my boss in neuropathology here Marat got a rhabdomyosarcoma from the nasopharynx that was handled by the neurosurgical team. So the idea behind here is to have more of a broad overview touching on things that are going to be helpful for your daily practice either because they have histologic similarities or they may fall into the differential. And the skull base, you know, this is a complex anatomic region and there are a lot of rare neoplasm and it stands just on the border between neuropathology and EMT pathology. Staging and treatment implications are made based on skull base involvement in EMT and optimal patient care uh, could be facilitated by bringing a little information from both sides. Here's a nice picture from Netter of the skull base um, divided into anterior, middle, and posterior fossas. And we have all these foramina with passages of nerves and vessels. And this area is very embryologically complex. We have mesoderm, ectoderm, migrating neural crest cells. And because of this, we can have some very interesting and rare tumors, as well as developmental abnormalities. And then we also have the pituitary gland and related structures. So very briefly, some normal histology of the skull base. Um, we're all pretty familiar with the pituitary gland, with our anterior pituitary, the acetophils and chromophobes and basophils uh, in their asini, and the posterior pituitary that looks more spindled, and you might have some axonal swelling known as herring bodies. Within the skull base, a lot of the things we might be dealing with are coming from the sinuses. So we have a lot of respiratory mucosa with the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Here's a goblet cell here. Seromucinous glands are present. We can even have salivary gland uh, neoplasms in this area and hyaline cartilage as well as bone. So let's start with developmental abnormalities and related lesions as kind of a warm up. Nasal glial heterotopias, uh, also known as nasal gliomas, even though they're not gliomas, are thought to arise from entrapped non neoplastic neuroectodermal tissue and is present in birth, though it may present much later with very non specific findings, even chronic sinusitis type findings are found as a mass on imaging. On the histology, you know, this is something very familiar to us, and we're often going to get this from ENT. ENT is going to come to us in neuropathology and say, hey, does this look like brain and so on? Um, and, you know, we, we might see some, some nice leptomeningeal elements, some vessels. We have our neurons and our reactive um, astrocytes. And um, the big thing for nasal glial heterotopias is we want to make sure that there is an extension from the central nervous system, which would make it a glial encephalocil. Uh, imaging and clinical information is important for this, and the surgical team will need to do additional work to make sure there isn't a cerebrospinal fluid leak um, or any kind of repair that's needed. Uh, Dr. Jelani and Dr. Kleinschmidt DeMasters recently had a paper that found overlapping molecular alterations between nasal glial heterotopias and glial encephalocils, and this might suggest that these are on a spectrum. Some other things that we're pretty used to dealing with in neuropathology are your epidermoid cyst, which we may see at the CP angle, 
or the paracellar region. And we have this nice bland stratified squamous epithelium, a nice granular layer and plenty of keratin debris. Dermoid cysts, on the other hand, uh, tend to have a predilection for the midline. In the orbit, they like to arise in the superotemporal orbital rim, and this is the most common orbital mass in children. In addition to our squamous epithelium, we also have agnexal structures and glands that are connected to the cyst wall. And then finally, Rathke cleft cysts, uh, which are located in the cella, and we hope to see the ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells, though this may be very attenuated in practice. An entity that's similar to these that occurs in the ear is the cholesteatoma. These can happen two ways. The first way is it can be congenital. It can just be entrapped epithelial rest that's similar to our epidermoid cyst. The other way and the much more common way is that this patient had trauma or they had a lot of otitis media infections in the past. Um, so they may present with odorous odorrhea and tinnitus and you can see local destruction on imaging. And the histology is very, very similar uh, to epidermoid cyst. We have the nice granular layer, keratin debris, and this is always, almost always going to have a lot of inflammation around it, um, cured with curatage or treated with curatage, but recurrences are common. A common pitfall to all of these uh, cysts is that they can rupture, and we can get a very robust reaction, uh, sometimes with multinucleate histocytes. Um, that might lead us to think about other things in the differential. So with that, we'll lead into the inflammatory lesions of the skull base. Cholesterol granuloma is a fairly common one. This happens in the middle ear and it's after recurrent ear infections, you know, or trauma. And what we see is we see all these cholesterol clefts and these giant cells and these cholesterol clefts are formed by a foreign body breakdown reaction to blood and lipid products. These are treated with drainage. Probably the most common acute inflammatory thing that I'm dealing with in ENT is invasive fungal rhinocytositis, and this can progress to the skull base. The clinical progression um, or the clinical presentation is acute and pretty fulminant. It's rapid and aggressive, and the two most common pathogens are mucor species and aspergillus. Here we have an example of mucor with this broad ribbon-like um, hyphae and 90-degree branching. The risk factors are immunocompromised uh, state, and the classic test question for mucor is the uncontrolled diabetes um, with this presenting um, as invasive fungal rhinocytositis. We should see tissue destruction, and hopefully we'll see vessels in viable tissue as well as angio invasion. And the treatment is aggressive surgical debridement and antifungal therapy. The, it does carry a high mortality rate, uh, some even estimating up to 80% in cases. So it is important that we make this diagnosis. But fungal disease in the sinuses and the skull base can be a little tricky. You know, first, how good are we at identifying the fungus correctly? Uh, there was a study from 2009 that did a 10-year retrospective study, and they, they found that we did pretty well. 79% of fungal organisms correctly identified, but 21% were incorrectly identified. Uh, with two potentially adverse outcomes. And the idea behind this is it's good to exercise a little caution um, and correlate to fungal for our to uh, cultures for our definitive fungal um, identification. Here are some examples from that paper. This was originally called aspergillus because of the branching uh, that looks like 45 degrees here. It turned out to be rhizopus. This one was thought to be mucor, uh, pretty broad looking in some of these, but it turned out to be Aspergillus niger. Um, so in a lot of cases, it's better to favor something and correlate with testing. Um, another challenge in fungal disease is frozens. You know, delay in therapy is associated with poor outcome, but on the other hand, this is gonna be treated with aggressive debridement. So it could be harmful to the patient uh, if the surgical team is wrong. So how good are we at first identifying fungal rhinosinusitis on frozen? One 10-year retrospective study from 2021 uh, showed that 90% of patients had at least one uh, frozen section that was positive for acute invasive fungal rhinocytositis. So we do pretty well um, in our sensitivity and specificity, though this is a very stressful event in pathology, especially late at night. And it can get a little complicated by what we're seeing under the microscope. This example is, is very straightforward. 
We have these hyphae that are suspicious for mucor with broad ribbon-like um, hyphal forms. It's in vessels, it's in viable tissue. I can see nuclei. This is a pretty slam dunk case of invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. However, a lot of times we get a picture that looks like this. We have the hyphal forms. I'm worried about mucor, but I don't see any viable tissue in the background. So, you know, how do we handle this? Because you know, fungus could just be hanging out in non-viable tissue without invasion. So discussion with the clinical team is very important with this. How suspicious are they? In this case, you know, I'm very suspicious, um, so I'm going to communicate that in my frozen. But I'm also taking into account that non-invasive fungal disease happens very commonly in the sinuses. You can have a mycetoma or fungus ball, um, and these just present with nonspecific symptoms. This is not going to be fulminant like an invasive fungal disease. And we see these dense um, hyphae. In this case, it was aspergillus. We also have allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, which occurs in longstanding chronic sinusitis. These can be a little scary looking um, if you don't look at them a lot because they kind of have this grungy basophilic look. They have this very thick mucin. Sometimes you'll get these tigered uh, tigroid stripes. Uh, that's, that's a good clue for allergic mucin as well as some charcoal lane crystals, which can be helpful. Um, switching to bacteria, uh, one thing that happens in the ear is necrotizing malignant otitis externa, which can progress to the skull base. This is caused by Pseudomonas, a bacteria that lives in the water and wet surfaces. This is also associated with diabetes, debilitation, immunodeficiency. We see very dense granulation tissue, this is treated with systemic and local antimicrobials, but there is a lot of problems with drug resistance. Sometimes uh, they might not get cultures up front and we might need to do PCR pathogen testing in these cases. Primary lymphocyte, lymphocytic hypophysitis is very rare um, and it's thought to be autoimmune with the classic picture being postpartum and pregnant women. Um, it presents with nonspecific signs that are related to the, uh, the pituitary being affected, such as hormone um, imbalances, um, headache. It may even have imaging that mimics a pit net. And we see this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. There are even a couple of even rarer uh, forms, such as the granulomatous and the xanthomatous hypophysitis. And we want to make sure that there is an infection, IgG4 disease, sarcoidosis, or other neoplasms going on. In the sinuses and in the airways, one thing we always need to be on the lookout for is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This is a necrotizing vasculitis of small and medium arteries, and it's called by, caused by antineutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies, specifically, uh, usually against proteinase 3. So classically, these are adults, and they're going to have upper airway, lung, and kidneys involved. And the classic histologic triad, which we don't see a lot, because we're often getting small biopsies, is that we have vasculitis here, we have vessels being destroyed, and then the necrosis is what's been described as like a zonal or a geographic necrosis, kind of like something you might see on a map, and it often has this basophilic grungy quality to it. And then finally, the granulomatous inflammation. These granulomas are never going to be very well formed. If you see very, very well formed granulomas, it's probably not granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Much more typical is this loose granulomatous inflammation in multinucleated giant cells. Another thing on the differential is extranodal NKT cell lymphoma, which is EBV associated. It used to be called lethal mid midline gr granuloma or angiocentric lymphoma. Um, clinically, these are often males with a East Asian or Central and South American um, heritage, and most of these happen in the nasal cavity of the head and neck. However, this isn't always the case. This, this particular case came from a middle-aged woman um, in the United States, and we see this diffuse and angiocentric proliferation of these neoplastic medium-sized cells. They're positive for CD3 and CD56, as well as some cytotoxic molecules, and EBV in situ hybridization is positive. We have to consider other hematolymphoid neoplasms in this location. This cellar mass was sent thinking that it's going to be a pituitary neuroendocrine tumor. It turned out to be a plasma cell neoplasm um, with kappa restriction. Diffuse large B cell lymphomas overall are going to be the most common in the head and neck. 
but we have a lot of examples of extranodal marginal zone lymphoma of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, especially in the ocular region and salivary glands. Langerhans cell histiocytosis may affect the craniofacial bones, positive for CD1A, and rosy Dorfman disease can occur in these locations with nice imperipolesis of these inflammatory cells being seen in the histiocyte cytoplasm. And with that, we'll move on to epithelioid neoplasms of the skull base. Um, so the first one is something that is histologically familiar to us, pit nets. These can occur in the sinonasal tract without direct extension from the cella, most commonly in the sphenoid sinus. Um, and it's thought to be related to possibly Raft Raftke's pouch remnants. The symptoms can be related to hormone dysfunction, um, sinusitis, and headache. Um, from a neuropathology perspective, these are classified in the same way as we would if it were arising in the cella, but we need to pay special attention to making sure it's not a mimic, such as a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, a paraganglioma, or an olfactory neuroblastoma. And hormonal markers and lineage markers like SF1 are helpful in this situation. The prognosis is dependent on the tumor type, um, and resection of these can be a little difficult, leading to re local recurrence. Well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors um, are very rare in the sinonasal region, but they do occur. Uh, they're, they're monotonous with these salt and pepper nuclei, and they're graded based on mites and necrosis. So if you have less than two mites per 10 millimeters squared, you're good for grade one as long as there are no ne necrosis. Two to 10 mites or necrosis, uh, you're thinking grade two. And ideally, you want that KI67 to be less than 20%. Uh, anything more than this, you're going to be thinking large cell neuroendocrine um, or small cell carcinomas. But an important pitfall in this region is that neuroendocrine markers are notoriously unreliable. Um, so the assessment of these neuroendocrine markers needs to be taken into the account of the tumor morphology and other findings. For example, here's some synaptophysin in an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. It can show up in melanoma or carcinomas teratocarcinosarcoma, and even meningioma. Head and neck paraganglioma is a tumor of the autonomic nervous system from the paraganglion cells, often around the vagus and glacopharyngeal nerves and carotid body. And we have this nice nested cell ball in pattern, um, plump eosinophilic cytoplasm, salt and pepper nuclei, and very classic staining is seen here, positive for synaptophysin. S100 shows that nice peripheral sustentacular pattern. These are positive for GATA3 and negative for keratins. Um, about 40% of patients with paraganglioma are thought to have a hereditary predisposition. And the most common of these, especially in this site, in the head and neck, is SDH mutations, which are part of the succinate dehydrogenase complex. You can have mutations in D, B, or C. And a great screening tool that we can use for these is immunohistochemistry for SDHB which is sitting right here in the middle of the complex. So if any of these proteins isn't working, SDHB won't be expressed. So just because we have loss of SDHB doesn't mean that the mutation is, is an SDHB, but it can be great for prompting additional testing, as well as this being a risk factor for metastasis um, in these cases. A quick note on paraganglioma is just a reminder that the CNS WHO terminology has changed uh, with now the cauda equina neuroendocrine tumor uh, being the official terminology where it was recently paraganglioma. The idea behind this is that these are molecularly distinct from those in the head and neck and other locations. So we don't have any SDHB loss. These are typified by overexpression of HOXB13. And interestingly, these don't show any GATA3 expression, where the ones in the head and neck are almost always positive for GATA3. These are sporadic, where most of the ones that we've been talking about in the head and neck, or not most, but a, a large proportion are related uh, to syndromes. Olfactory neuroblastoma is a malignant uh, tumor of the olfactory neuroepithelium, usually adults, and this is arising near the cribriform plate. It's staged clinically based on what it involves, uh, nasal cavity alone, or does it make it past the paranasal sinuses or even metastasize? Histologically, we have these lobules of these salt and pepper cells. We should have variable fibrillary neuropil-like background in our 
well-differentiated olfactory neuroblastomas. And they're positive for synaptophysin and show this S100 sustentacular pattern. Um, where, th where olfactory neuroblastoma gets a little tricky is the grading system. So most people use Hyams grading to grade these, but the Hyams grading system is a little subjective. Um, so both clinically and as well as within ENT pathology, most people will kind of divide these into low and high grade with the one and two tumors representing the low grade uh, versions and the three and four being the high grade um, with higher rates of metastases and lower overall survival. So here we have a nice low grade Hyams one, two example. The lobular pattern is retained. We're not seeing many mitoses. It's it, either you're not finding mitoses or you found maybe one somewhere. Um, you're not seeing nuclear pleomorphism, and there's no necrosis. However, when you get to grade three and four, we get this loss of the lobular pattern. We get sheeting. The cells look worse. We have increased mitosis and necrosis. Um, so, you know, where you divide this line between three and four is subjective, but clinically, putting it into low grade and high grade is helpful um, for their treatment um, and any trials that they may be doing. An important pitfall in olfactory neuroblastoma is, is the rosettes. Homer Wright rosettes can be seen in pretty much any um, olfactory neuroblastoma, but Flexner Wintersteiner true rosettes with a true central lumen are, are listed in the Hyams grading as, as something that occurs in the grade three tumors um, and not the lower grade. But you want to be really careful with this because olfactory neuroblastomas are known to have glandular differentiation. They can all have all kinds of just changes that mimic rosettes. Like this one, for instance, doesn't have the cytoplasmic processes of a true rosette. So all of this is to say is when grading these, be very, very cautious on your Flexner Winter Steiner rosettes. Um, you, want, you really want to see increased mites and necrosis and pleomorphism when getting to that high grade category. Adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma is thought to arise from Rathke pouch remnants and has a bimodal distribution. This is something that we're familiar with in neuropathology. Solid and cystic on imaging, and you know they talk about this classic machine or motor oil cis fluid. It has this nice peripheral palisading, loose stellate reticulum, and the ghost cells or the wet keratin um, that's very striking. These are driven by CTNNB1 mutations of exon 3, and you can highlight nuclear beta catenin in making this diagnosis. Though this is not really going to come up because clinically we're pretty good at differentiating the adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma from this, you can have sinonasal amyloblastomas. These are, these are odontogenic tumors, and usually they're occurring in the jaw, but they can arise in the sinonasal tract. And you also have this peripheral palisading. That should have a reverse polarization here, stellate reticulum. And you can have some squamous differentiation. You're not going to see a ghost cells or wet keratin, but you can have a little squamous change um, in these. These now, sinonasal amyloblastomas are rare. A traditional amyloblastomas uh, typically show BRAF or RAS mutations. So you might be able to use a BRAF P600E in one of these cases, if you wanted to look a little more into the molecular phenotype. Papillary craniopharyngioma is thought to arise from Rathke's pouch remnants, and it's seen in adults. It's usually more solid and cauliflower-like with these bland, non-keratinizing squamous epithelium and fibrovascular core, making this papillary structure. Um, these show BRAF B600E mutations that we can often show on immunohistochemistry. Within the head and neck, there's a new molecular player in squamous cell carcinoma that could come into this differential of um, a papillary craniopharyngioma, and that's the DEC AFF2 fusion. So a subset of non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma show DEC AFF2. Some people think that this might um, might be classified as a separate carcinoma, but right now in the WHO, it is non-keratinizing squamous cell. It can happen in the sinonasal tract, middle ear, temporal bone, nasopharynx, orbit, and it shows exophytic and endophytic growth in papillary formation. These look a lot like inverted sinonasal papillomas um, with dysplasia, um, or what was used to be called Schneiderian papillomas or Schneiderian carcinoma. 
the cells, and, and why these can be a little tricky is the cells tend to be a little more monotonous. Um, there are some examples that look worse, but a lot of times you might not find a lot of mitoses. But a good histologic clue is that a lot of these have transmigrating neutrophils, which is something we see in inverted papillomas. Um, but unlike inverted papillomas, they don't have surface cilia, they don't have goblet cells, and they are invasive, even though um, they do kind of resemble the uh, inverted papilloma. They have frequent local recurrence, probably related to all of this endophytic growth, uh, but the data is very limited on these. The other variant of non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma in the sinonasal tract and skull base tends to look a little worse. And high-risk HPV has, an, has been implicated in up to 82% of these cases. Anecdotally, if I'm getting one of these cases, the more mitosis I see, the more necrosis, the worse it looks, the more I think maybe this is related to high-risk HPV. Um, you will see diffuse and strong P16 positivity, but this is an important pitfall because P16 can show up in so many of these high-grade epithelioid malignancies in the skull base. It's not like the oropharynx where we can use P16 as a surrogate marker. Here, if we're investigating for high-risk HPV, which is not required in the site, um, we need to do RNA um, in situ hybridization uh, to prove the high-risk HPV. And again, this is not something that you necessarily need to do in practice because it's uncertain whether this HPV status is clinically significant. But a lot of ENT pathologists are, are doing a lot more of this high-risk HPV testing. Um, and we'll see what happens in the future with these. Um, a big pitfall here is that for non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, we need to make sure that it's not one of these other mimics in the sinonasal tract, such as the SWE SNF complex deficient sinonasal carcinomas, nut carcinoma, adamantinoma like Ewing, and a couple of others that we'll discuss now. SWE SNF complex deficient sinonasal carcinomas have either SMARC-B1 or SMARC-A4 alterations. They occur in adults, usually men, and they often present with advanced disease, and these are very aggressive. Over 50% of patients die within two years. They can have a lot of different looks. Um, so here we have SMARC-B1 deficient. You can have this kind of plasmacytoid to rhabdoid pink appearance here. You can also have a very basaloid and blue tumor. Recently, they've described this adenocarcinoma-like phenotype uh, that even looks like yolk sac tumor and is positive for cell four and glipocan three. Um, so this could be a pitfall if one might um, think about germ cell tumors and such. Um, on the other hand, SMARC-A4 tend to have greater anaplasia. They tend to be more undifferentiated and more neuroendocrine-like in their appearance. These are rarer. Uh, both are rare, uh, but it's a great idea in these locations to go ahead and do an INI1 and a BRG1, especially if the cells look kind of monotonous. You know, I, I think of them as they're, they're monotonously malignant. You know, you look at this tumor and you're like, you know, this is a carcinoma, but they are all cut from the same cloth. So this is a great clue that you might be dealing with some kind of molecular driver in these uh, skull base and sinus carcinomas. Smart b one uh, positive for pancytokeratin, CK7, variable P63 and P40, and INI1 loss. While smart a 4 uh, might have a bit more synaptophysin, <coughs> which can be confusing if you're thinking about these neuroendocrine tumors, they're negative for CK5, P63, and P40 usually, and you can demonstrate BRG1 loss by immunohistochemistry. Um, you know, speaking of SMART-B1 alterations, you could also have a cellar atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, which is something a little more um, in the neuropathology realm of things. Cellar examples have been reported predominantly in women, um, such as middle-aged women. And though this is clinically distinct, Johan et al. Um, in 2018 showed that these ATRTs are clustering with the ATRT MIC and not a distinct epigenetic group. Um, so this might be a consideration when the point of origin isn't well known um, because the smart b one the smart a4, I mean, they're bad tumors and skull base involvement can be very frequent. It can be difficult sometimes to say exactly where it's arising. Nut carcinoma is another consideration, and these are um, typified by um, gene re rearrangements in nut M1. 
very monotonous again. And on test questions, if anyone's taking pathology boards or anything, um, they talk about this abrupt keratinization where suddenly you have keratin. Um, you know, the nut antibody is very useful for these. Some of them may express CD34, uh, which can, can lead to some pitfalls. Adamantinoma like Ewing sarcoma is another rare consideration. And the reason these are, are so challenging is that they have a lot of P40 and cytokeratin positivity. So, you know, you might think, well, could this be a squamous cell carcinoma? And in fact, a lot of them do show squamous differentiation with these keratin pearls. They can also show rosette formations. Usually they're basaloid um, and, you know, pretty monotonous. They're positive for keratins, P63 and P40, and they show strong membranous CD99. Um, negative for S100, Desmond and Nut, negative for high-risk HPV by in situ hybridization, and you can do molecular testing uh, to confirm these with EWSR1, FLY1 rearrangements. Teratocarcinosarcoma is a very interesting tumor that also occurs in this location. This is a malignant neoplasm with epithelial, mesenchymal, and primitive neuroepithelial elements that occurs in the sinonasal tract, rarely in the orbit, um, occurs in the skull base and cribriform plate, with some people thinking that these might be arising from some olfactory epithelium. These are not thought to be related to germ cell neoplasms. They're negative for germ cell markers, they're negative for cell 4 and PLAP, and they don't have alterations of, um, of 12P. So uh, these are supposed to be, or thought to be a distinct multi-lineage tumor. And molecularly, they most often show SMARK-A4 mutations, and they can also show CTNNB1 mutations. Um, so this is a paper that came out last year from Rupert and colleagues, uh, just showing this wide spectrum of things that can happen to retocarcinoma, uh, carcinosarcoma, and showing why we maybe brought this case um, from ENT, especially to look at uh, some of these neuroepithelial elements. Um, like here, we have this neuropill-like um, material in ganglion cells, uh, rosettes. We should have mesenchymal elements in, of all different types and epithelial elements of all types. And, you know, you can see here that sampling is a big thing in teratocarcinosarcoma because we might just sample one of the elements. These can be very difficult tumors uh, to diagnose, and they are rare. Um, and so, you know, molecular testing may be warranted in some of these um, and, uh, and close look for these different elements and evaluation if there is enough tissue. Other mimics that come up are sinonasal rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, these would be other mimics of like epithelial, epithelioid neoplasms. Uh, these are the most common um, sarcoma of the uh, sinonasal tract. And they can happen in the orbit, ear, and temporal bones, and so on. And we can use Desmond and myogenin to investigate these, as well as PAX3 rearrangements for the alveolar subtype. Sinonasal mucosal melanoma um, can arise as well. Uh, you can get lucky and get some nice uh, pigment deposition, but a lot of times these melanomas are going to be pretty variable in their immunostain. So I tend to get pretty much all the melanoma markers when I'm, when I'm investigating these, if I have a high clinical suspicion. You can also have sinonasal adenocarcinomas of intestinal and non-intestinal types. Here's an example of an intestinal type, um, sinonasal adenocarcinoma that's involving the dura. Um, and so these can also occur, but we need to make sure it's not a metastasis from somewhere else. We need to make sure it's not a salivary gland tumor. Sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, or SNUG, has become a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, this is usually in adults, and it's a large destructive mass on, on presentation. And like the, you know, SWE SNF, uh, these are kind of monotonously malignant tumors. You look at it, you know it's malignant, but everything sort of looks the same. And this is reflective of the fact that a lot of these show IDH2 hotspot mutations. You can also have IDH1. Um, they're positive for keratins, but they're negative for CK56. They're negative for P40. You don't have any specific markers of differentiation. You shouldn't have high-risk HPV. Now, in the WHO now, you don't have to do molecular testing um, to make a diagnosis of SNUC. But it also says you should rule out everything else 
when making a diagnosis of SNUC. So this can be a little tricky. And, and this is a diagnosis that I show a lot of caution um, in making. Here's an example. Five, over five years ago, it was diagnosed as a cytonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, but it had a very interesting um, translocation. And just last year, uh, this paper came out that this case would qualify war, for as a recurrent EWSR1 coal CA2 fusion um, of a novel sarcoma with spindle round cell morphology with a strong predilection for the cytonasal tract. Um, so this is just to emphasize, this is a very rapidly expanding field in head and neck pathology. And there are a lot of different molecular alterations that are coming up. Um, these cases may benefit from molecular testing for classification, though treatment wise, there are not a lot of treatment differences yet. So this is just kind of a brief overview of, you know, what is my immunohistochemical approach uh, in sinonasal tract epithelioid neoplasms? Well, I start out with lineage markers, keratins, P63 and P40. I'm not afraid to double up in these cases because I may be using them for different things. P63 is great for myoepithelial cells, for instance. S100 and SOX10 for melanoma, for salivary gland neoplasms, but keeping in mind that SOX10 can show up in basaloid squamous cell carcinoma and be a pitfall. Then I'm going to refine it with INI1, BRG1, and NUT. And then I may chase a different um, diagnosis that I'm suspicious for, such as rhabdomyosarcoma, um, adamantinoma like Ewing. And in my practice, I have to send out for high-risk HPD. So I do order P16 as a screening process. If you do use P16, just know this is not a slam dunk HPV stain. Um, it needs to be confirmed with high-risk HPV and then molecular testing in select cases. Um, and finally, let's talk briefly about mesenchymal-related neoplasms of the skull base. You can have meningiomas in the sinonasal tract uh, that look like meningiomas that we encounter in neuropathology. People get nervous about meningiomas in the sinonasal tract um, because they can have this very infiltrative appearance. We see it all the time in the bone, how meningioma just kind of snakes through bone. Um, and in the sinonasal tract, it does this as well, uh, as well and around glands, but this is not thought to be a prognostically, prognostically poor um, feature. And there have been some limited studies that suggest that the grading you know, is similar to those we would see in neuropathology. But in making a diagnosis of meningioma, we have to think about you know, other things in the differential, such as solitary fibrous tumor with our large gaping vessels and STAT6 positivity, paraganglioma, which we already discussed, that is positive for GATA3. Uh, we can have pit nets um, and hormonal markers. And, and one interesting tumor is cytonasal glomangiopericytoma. Here's an example of that. It's a soft tissue tumor. And um, it's just perivascular myoid differentiation. It used to be called cytonasal hemangiopericytoma. They're unencapsulated, and they're made of these kind of bland ovoid cells that are arranged in a syncytial-like arrangement. A histologic clue could be these um, perithelomatous hyalinized vessels. And these show um, beta nuclear beta-catenin due to them being driven by CTN and B1 mutations. They're also positive for SMA, negative for STAT6, S100, and SOX10, and keratins. We're very familiar with schwannoma um, in neuropathology uh, with our loose and compact areas. And these can, of course, happen in the, in the sinonasal tract. Um, in familial cases, this is just to point out, um, since we've been talking about smart B1 a lot, that we can have this mosaic pattern of I and I walk INI1 loss in familial cases of schwannoma, whether it's schwannomatosis from SMART-B1 or neurofibromatosis 2 from NF2. Um, so that's just a, a pitfall we might encounter. Another thing that's on the differential of schwannoma that occurs in this site is biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. This is a malignant spindle cell neoplasm of the sinonasal tract, and it shows myogenic and neural differentiation. Um, and it, it occurs in this area, it shows local infiltration, um, but, and when patients with a female predominance. And here's an example. It's unencapsulated, and it tends to kind of entrap background epithelium, and this background epithelium gets very hyperplastic. It forms fascicles of these eosinophilic spindled cells. Some of them might get a little wavy, might make us think of that neurogenetic differentiation, but you're not gonna see a lot of mitoses. You're not going to see ne necrosis. This is not going to be the most malignant tumor you've seen. 
Um, and we can show our myogenic differentia with, differentiation with SMA, sometimes Desmond, um, and our neurogenic differentiation with S100. And this S100 is going to be pretty patchy. It's not going to be diffusely S100 like a schwannoma. A helpful clue is that SOX10 is always negative. Um, so it's, a, it's great practice to just do these together. Um, if you're thinking about biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma, and if you need to confirm, these are driven by PAX3 mammal 3 fusions in most cases. <clears throat> you may also have synovial sarcoma um, in these sites, usually young adults, typified by SS18, SSX1 uh, gene fusions. And um, in the biphasic form, you can have epithelial um, and our, our spindle morphologies. These show variable immunohistochemistry, including cytokeratin that's patchy, that could be a pitfall, as well as TLE1 positivity. This, this is not a very specific stain. Chordomas, uh, we see a lot in neuropathology, neoplasms of notochordal differentiation arising in the axial skeleton and skull base. Um, we talk about our famous physoliverous cells uh, that are bubbly, and these lobules and cords of tumors. They're positive for brachyuria and EMA and pancytokeratin S100, and INI1 should be retained in conventional examples, though it is lost in poorly differentiated chordomas, uh, though they still retain brachyuria. One thing we might consider in this differential is extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma, which is a terrible name uh, because these aren't chondrosarcomas, and people are considering changing this name to reflect the gene rearrangement that drives it, which is NR4A3. Um, so these can occur in the sinonasal tract and intracranial uh, sites. And we have the uh, kind of a lobular architecture and we can have cords and clusters of things that might make us think about chordoma, though, um, you know, chordoma, we expect that in the axial skeleton. The immunostaining is very unreliable for these. Um, so if it's not staining well for anything, it has this appearance that's more of a, a good look for extraskeletal myxoid conjure sarcoma. They can have a little S100, they can have a little C kit, and so on. And um, if you want to prove it, NR4A3 gene rearrangements. Finally, um, conventional conjure sarcoma, which is a conjure sarcoma. Uh, this, is, this is very rare in the maxilla and facial skeleton. So if you get something like this, that's, that's arising in the facial skeleton, think about chondroblastic osteosarcoma first. Really look for that osteoid matrix, um, discuss with soft tissue, because uh, this would be much more common in the maxillofacial bones. Uh, we have these um, invasive lobules of neoplastic cartilage that are um, overrunning and infiltrating and destroying bone, positive for S100, negative for brachyuri. And interestingly, the skull-based examples tend to have a high IDH1 mutation rate, while those in the facial bones tend to be ID1, IDH1 wild type. Um, and this is a paper by Talagas um, in 2019. So with that, uh, let's take a look at our digital slides um, as we review and uh, right before we open for questions. And these will hopefully be relevant to the, uh, the questions for CME uh, credit. So uh, here's our first case, case one. Uh, this is a 40-year-old woman with a two-centimeter skull-based mass. It looks bad by imaging. And for low power, I mean, this example, you know, has a lot of blood. I'm not even thinking about angiosarcoma in this case. Um, but we look a little closer, and we notice this, this is that monotonously malignant look. You, you look at these cells and you know this has got to be a malignant neoplasm, but everything is sort of the same size. It all kind of looks like it's cut from the same cloth. You have this kind of eccentric nuclei placement, um, plasma set cytoid to rhabdoid, the nucle prominent nucleoli, a lot of vesicular nuclei. This is an example of a SMARC-B1 deficient cytonasal carcinoma, a SWE SNF carcinoma. Um, and the clue to these is that monotonously malignant appearance. They can be pink like this, or they can be blue and have a very basaloid appearance. And doing INI1 is very helpful in the um, evaluation of these. These are a terrible prognosis. Uh, most patients, about 50%, are uh, have died within um, two years, and um, they tend to present with advanced disease. Case two is a 60-year-old woman with a two centimeter nasopharyngeal mass. 
even from low power, we can see that this is very papillary looking. And when we look a little closer, we notice again that all the cells look kind of similar. But unlike the last case, you know, these aren't the most malignant cells I've ever seen. You know, I, I'm having trouble finding a mitosis, for instance. But there is a nice clue here. We have all of these transmigrating neutrophils. So your ENT colleague uh, may, you know, uh, say that, that this looks like a like a Schneiderian um, carcinoma ex papilloma, or um, an inverted uh, papilloma with high grade dysplasia, or a carcinoma rising out of it. And this is a great histologic appearance for the DEC AFF2 carcinomas, which are currently considered in the WHO a variant of non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. Finally, um, this is a 72-year-old woman with a 2.6 centimeter nasal mass. And here it looks too cellular. We have entrapped epithelial elements that are getting hyperplastic. And when we look a little closer, we see that this neoplasm um, is composed of these spindled cells. Some of them are a little eosinophilic. Um, they're ovoid, some might be a little wavy. And um, this is positive for SMA, showing myogenic differentiation, positive for S100, patchy positive, showing neurogenic, and it is negative for SOX10. Um, this is our biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma. And if you want to confirm, uh, this shows PAX3 rearrangements. Um, so, all right. Um, well, uh, so now I will open up for questions um, and discussion. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I've stopped sharing. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nix. At this time, we'll move into Q&A. You can submit your questions in the chat box, or you can unmute to ask a question. When you submit a question via the chat box, please make sure the message goes to everyone so that both presenters and attendees can see it. And to unmute, select the microphone in the lower left corner. And after you've asked your question, please remute to avoid background noise. Um, okay, those pictures were spectacular, just by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope they were helpful. Um, oh, and yeah. A lot of these did come to the neuropathology service at one point or another. So, Okay. Um, so it looks like we have a question. It says, um, Marat Gatin, from now on, any case I get from skull base that has epithelioid or spindle cell features go to Steven? <laughs> and that's that's my boss in neuropathology here, but he's selling okay. himself short. He, he works up a lot of these cases. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, you're gonna say something? Oh yeah, um, and I was just gonna say, I have a few summary slides too after the questions, um, but yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm never really quite sure whether I should ask this question or not, but like, I don't understand how the, the a succinate dehydrogenase mutation gives you a tumor since I don't think of that as like a tumor gene. <laughs> I, I do not know, honestly. I wish I could answer that question, um, but it has become very standard practice in paragangliomas to make sure and document the SDHB and then discuss these kind of genetic implications. And then do you sequence the tumor? Like do you send it for sequencing um, or? It, that would be up to the clinical team. Uh, in my practice here at Arkansas, we do the immunostain um, and then we recommend we send almost all of our neuropathology cases for sequencing. So if it went to the neuropathology service, it's a high likelihood we're gonna sequence it. If it went to the ENT service here right now, these tend to be kind of a sequencing as requested. Okay. And then we do have a question, um, Vivian Tang, do you have any advice for a neuropathologist seeking additional training in head and neck without a formal fellowship? Yeah, and you know, there, there aren't that many head and neck fellowships um, out there. And a lot of people are trained on the job now. Uh, when I was doing my neuropathology fellowship at Hopkins, um, I, I went to the consult service in ENT every day and I reviewed all of the consult cases at night. So I just kind of, you know, did it informally, but in a structured and consistent way. And ENT is very needed. And 
it's it's one of these fields that's so rapidly expanding in terms of molecular that I think neuropathologists are very well equipped um, for for some some of the changes that are happening in this field. And I think there's a lot that we can contribute to ENT pathology. Um, and then we have a couple comments. Excellent talk, super presentation. And then th there is a question when presenting. Um, Aureli Cuevas Ocampos, I think. When presenting with a plasma cell neoplasm, I limit my final diagnosis to plasma, neo plasma cell neoplasm cap or lambda restricted, and I mentioned differential diagnosis. Do you perform further workup or provide additional molecular information? We, we do the same thing in our practice um, because it's got to be looked at clinically. Um, so we tend to make the additional um, the initial diagnosis, and then we work with either HemePath or the clinical team um, for, for additional. But yes, plasma cell neoplasm cap are restricted. Um, and then I'll put in a comment about the clinical history if something was known. This case that was presented today was a complete surprise. Um, so, you know, it happens. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. And then Greg Wells would like to know, does methylomics have a role or future role in these diagnoses? I think it 100% has a future role in these diagnoses, and I wish that um, that I were involved in doing it right now. Um, there are some small, um, there are some papers that are starting to come out, especially with these cytonasal undifferentiated tumors. It is such a problem. There's such overlap, and you know, the more we learn about these, the more I think that these these diagnostic findings will be relevant to our clinical practice, to patient prognoses. Right now, we're coming off of a long line of everything is thrown in the snuck, and now we're starting to piecemeal it out. So I, I think uh, methylomics is, would just be a great uh, opportunity here. Okay, and then uh, maybe we'll do one more question and then you wanna show the wrap up slides, the summary slides? Yeah, Okay, so you. we have one more question, Sarah Stone. How often do you find site of origin in question? And to follow up for that, have you been asked as NP to assist with ENT frozen? What cases are challenging? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of times with the things that are coming out of the sinonasal tract, it they'll they'll the radiology will tend to favor that it's coming from the sinonasal tract. We have, um, for example, this this Smart B one deficient one that I that I showed, really there was no idea where this was coming from. It was in the skull base. You didn't know if it was coming, you know, from north or south. Um, but um, a lot of times imaging is important and discussion with the clinical team. And a lot of time ENT and neurosurgery are working together on these. Um, I Because I do general frozens and ENT here, um, I tend to do a lot of the, in, the neuropath and ENT together. Um, but, um, Marat has, has certainly been asked to come down as well um, for strange ENT frozens and give um, a differential uh, diagnosis. But a lot of times, you know, malignant neoplasm and, uh, and we need to work up. Um, but, and, and yeah, I would say, you know, some of the most challenging cases are these, these undifferentiated tumors in the sinonasal tract. Um, and, um, and yeah, I, I, I would like to do more molecular than I'm able to right now. Um, so maybe in the future, we'll, we'll find more information. It'll become more standard. All right. Um, and, and if you have any other questions or anything else comes up, please please feel free to email me. And I'll, I'll share the screen real quick and just do the, uh, the concluding uh, PowerPoint slides, which will be brief. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, in summary, this is a very complex site uh, where we can have developmental abnormalities as well as contributions from epithelial, mesenchymal, sometimes all three in the case of teratocarcinosarcoma, uh, possibly depending on the etiology. And assessment is benefited from, you know, having a little knowledge of neuropathology and ENT together and working together. We have a lot of familiar neuropathologic entities that show up in ENT, um, what used to be called, you know, nasal glioma, which is a nasal glial heterotopia, ectopic pitnets and meningiomas and schwannomas, as well as some of our developmental cysts. Inflammatory lesions, infectious diseases, especially acute fungal sinusitis, 
is, is what I'm seeing in a, in a fulminate or acute setting most often. Um, and that's probably the most stressful, you know, trying to find the fungal hyphae on, on frozen late at night. And then in the ear, we might think about pseudomonas, especially if someone has diabetes or is immunocompromised and we see a lot of granulation tissue. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis can involve the skull base. Um, we may not see all of the classic features. We may not see our kidney, lung, and upper, um, you know, sinonasal involvement. Um, and we may not see the classic histologic features, uh, but hopefully we'll see nice vasculitis. Keep in mind this is zonal map-like necrosis that has a very blue, crunchy look, and the granulomas are not very well formed, very, very loose granulomatous inflammation. Extranodal NKT cell happens in the site. Uh, we'll look for diffuse and angiocentric neoplastic cells, EBV positive, and then of course other lymphomas, IgG4 disease, and sarcoidosis. Epithelioid neoplasms today in the skull base and sinonasal tract require a lot of workup. We need to make sure um, in non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, you're not required to document a DEC AFF2, and you're not required to say that there's high-risk HPV. But the WHO does want you to rule out your SWE SNF complex deficient carcinomas. I will almost always do an INI1, BRG1, um, if it's very monotonous, uh, you might consider nut. And then also keep in mind, based on sampling, you may have other elements, um, such as might be seen in teratocarcinosarcoma. And probably the biggest, you know, thing is, you know, sino snuck or sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma. Think of this as a diagnosis of exclusion, and you may even consider being a little hedgy and favoring it if you don't have molecular, uh, just because we have new molecular alterations in this area coming out all the time. Um, and then some other things uh, like rhabdomyosarcoma and melanoma, adamantinoma like Ewing can also mimic these epithelioid neoplasms. Finally, our mesenchymal neoplasms can look a little like neuropathologic um, entities. Um, sinonasal glomangioparasitoma. Um, you can use uh, nuclear beta-catenin to show that CTNNB1 mutation and be supportive of the diagnosis. Biphenotypic sinonasal sarcoma has PAX3 and mammal 3 fusions. And the important thing on this one is it has myogenic, um, neurogenic uh, differentiation with SMA usually and patchy S100, and it does not show SOX10. SOX10 is negative in biphenotypic sinonasal, and it's not gonna be super malignant looking. You're not gonna see necrosis. You're not gonna see a lot of mites. You may see synovial sarcoma, and then we might consider extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma that is reported in these sites. These are driven by NR4A3 gene rearrangements. They're not chondrosarcomas, and the name may be changing in the future to reflect that. Um, so here are some references, and uh, thank you again. It's really an honor to be teaching it, um, uh, to be presenting at AMP Teaching Round. So uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Nix. Thank you again to everyone for joining today's AANP Teaching Rounds presentation. We would ask that you take a few minutes to complete a short evaluation as completion helps ensure accurate reporting to the accreditation board. A link to the evaluation will appear on your PATH LMS screen upon the conclusion of the Zoom meeting, or you can navigate back to the main course and select the evaluation option. Once you have completed the evaluation and selected your credit amount, Please then select the appropriate certificate based on your credentials. The PowerPoint slides and recording will be posted to the AAMP website in the next week. Thank you again to Dr. Nix for an excellent presentation. This concludes the session for today. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.